all of us understand the power of the tongue. In just a matter of seconds, you can absolutely destroy someone's self-image. In a matter of a minute or so, a parent can set a stage for a child's future behavior as a result of what they say in a manner that all of that child's life, they'll have to deal with what their parents said to them. Because the tongue can create great joy, uplifting, happiness, peace, a sense of security and warmth and confidence and assurance, or it can absolutely destroy all of that in a matter of moments. And my friend, it's one thing for the lost man who doesn't have any control to create all kinds of dissension and disunity in the family or the church or his business or among his friends with his tongue. But what about God's people? The truth is we can have the same kind of problems. So back now to Ephesians chapter 4 to what Paul says. A word here and he says four things I want to notice in this passage. Because first of all he gives us a caution. Listen to what he says in verse 29. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment that it may give grace to those who hear. Now, what does he mean by unwholesome? Or I believe in the King James, he says, no corrupt word or corrupt conversation. When he says unwholesome, he means rotten, bad. He means something that is unfit and worthless he says, don't let words proceed out of your mouth that are worthless. Now, all of us know that. All of us know that to control the tongue is very important. So we have to be careful what we say. And sometimes we, we think around certain people, well, I can say anything I want to. Well, the truth is we ought to want to say the right thing. He says, walk in the manner worthy of your calling. What is our calling? Our calling is the Christ likeness. He says, let no unwholesome speech proceed out of your mouth. Anything that is destructive, destroying somebody's character, creating disunity and harmony. Now listen to what he says. You think, well, what in the world does this have to do with that? And usually when people go through these verses, they separate them and they'll preach four different sermons on four different verses because they don't seem to relate to each other, but they do relate to each other. Listen, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. Only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by which you were sealed for the day of redemption. Listen, not only does it affect the person who hears, or a person who relates what you said, but the Bible says unwholesome speech grieves the Holy Spirit. Now you can only grieve someone who loves you. He says God is grieved when you and I, by the use of our tongue, create a false image, pass on false information, or even when we tell the truth that is hurtful and is critical and destructive and demeaning and belittling, and stripping someone else of their reputation. He says, don't let unwholesome speech proceed out of your mouth, first of all, because of what it does to the other person, but secondly, he says it grieves God. Unwholesome speech never attributes anything good. And he says, when we off the cuff, in a moment of anger, or just thoughtlessly say something like that, he says, it grieves the Spirit of God. So he says, let no unwholesome speech proceed out of your mouth. Okay, that's the first caution. Now, look, if you will, in Psalm 141 for a moment. And this is a very simple verse, but it has so much to say. Verse 3 of Psalm 141, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Now, that's a pretty good prayer, amen? Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. God, guide me in what I say. Not necessarily to say everything I think, but Lord, to say that which is edifying and building up. Set a guard over my mouth. You know, I can remember, I can still remember today something that I said to my mother. I was in the first grade, so I was around six years of age or somewhere thereabouts. I can remember today getting angry with my mom. She was going somewhere and she wouldn't let me go. I remember getting angry at her and saying something real unkind. Now, I didn't know any dirty words at that time. And um, so it wasn't anything dirty. It was just very, very angry and harsh. I said to my mother, let me tell you something. 
she looked down at me and she said, Charles, a soft answer turneth away wrath. I didn't even know what it meant. <laughs> but I can still remember her saying that to me. I know what it means now. I didn't even know what it meant. But it's like God wrote that on my brain. A soft answer turneth away wrath. Lord, put a guard on our mouth. Control our lips. Cautions all through the Word of God about what we say to people and how we say it. Now, I want you to notice something else in that. He says, this is the character of our conversation. This is the way we ought to talk. Back to Ephesians now, chapter 4. He says, this is the way we ought to talk. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, according to the need of the moment, that it may give grace to those who hear. So he says, these are three characteristics of the conversation that you and I should be speaking. What are they? Number one, he says it should be edifying. That is, what we say to others should build them up. Should build them up. I can remember right now a person in my life, and when I think about him, I always think encouragement because he would oftentimes stop me and talk with me and he always had an encouraging word. In fact, I never remember anything negative that man ever said. He was always positive, always encouraging. Haven't you met people that you saw them coming? You thought, oh my goodness. Because they were so full of negativism, everywhere they go, they're just spewing. No, 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 it won't work. I'm against that. Mm, 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 mm. Or everything's negative. And then you've met people, you see them coming, you think, hallelujah, what a breath of fresh air. Listen, he says, let your speech be not unwholesome, but edifying. That is building up the other person. What in the world happens in a family when the husband builds up the wife? The wife builds up the husband. They're building up the children. The children are building up them. I'll tell you, it's hard to have an argument in a family like that because everybody's positive. And when things do arise, you're able to settle them without anger and bitterness and hostility and division and strife and disunity developing. It all is right here with the tongue. He says, now the character and the characteristic, the quality of our language ought to be, first of all, it ought to be edifying, encouraging, positive, stimulating. Second thing I want you to notice here, back over to Ephesians now, chapter 4. Listen to what he says. Not only does he say it should be edifying, but he says, such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment. Now listen. It is when you and I say certain things, not only what we say and how we say them, but when we say them. Sometimes you and I will meet someone who's really hurting bad. I mean, they are down in the dump so far down, they're way beneath the bottom. Sometimes all they need is to say, you know, I just want you to know, you have really encouraged me. You've been such a tremendous blessing to me. You know what happens? They come flying out of the dumps. Because all of a sudden, what you have done at a given moment, at the, at the right time when they needed a word of encouragement, you made them feel important. How many women in here tonight would say, you know, I wish my husband would just, every once in a while, if he'd just tell me, honey, you're just gorgeous. <laughs> because every once in a while, she needs to feel like that there's no woman in the world like her to you. And likewise and equally so, every man needs to be affirmed by his wife or reaffirmed by his wife. Honey, you're the greatest guy in the world. You know what the problem is? Listen. The problem is we are not, we are very expressive about the things we don't like. Why don't we get equally expressive about the things we do like? If we were as positive and as aggressively expressive about the things we do like, do you know what would happen? <laughs> I'll tell you what would happen. You would unlike less and less and you would begin to see more and more. You'd become a positive person. I want to tell you, a negative tongue will affect your business, your family, your social life. Listen, a negative tongue will affect your abilities and talents. And I want to say this to students. Don't say, boy, I'm, I didn't do so well on the last test. I probably won't do a bit better today. Listen, I'm going to tell you, you j listen, you just ruined yourself. We must control the tongue. Listen, even if you think it, don't say it. 
You say, well, now, wait a minute. If I think it, I might as well say it. No, you might as well not either. It is amazing. When, listen, it is amazing the effect it has on you when your ears hear your voice talk about you in the negative. You say, well, if I think it, I might as well say it. Oh, no, you might as well. That's like somebody says, well, if I think sin, I might as well sin. Oh, you ask God about that one. There's no way for that to be true. And the same thing is true with our tongue. Watch what you say. You see, if you have a responsibility and you feel a little uneasy and you lack confidence, I want to just tell you something. I'm going to show you something that I say to myself every day, sometimes many times of the day, because I know it's true. I know of experiences, so I know it's true. And sometimes when I'm facing something big or a big challenge, I just say, this is what I say. I say, thank you, Lord, that I'm walking in the sunlight of your love. Boy, that puts me in a super fantastic position. Thank you, Lord, that Christ is my life. That makes me adequate for every situation, so I don't have to worry about it. The Holy Spirit is the sole owner and operator of my life. That means my words, my walk, and my work is under His control. Here's what I want you to see. You don't understand the effect that your words have on your ears and your mind and the rest of your body. That's why it's so very important that we encourage our children, that we encourage young people, that we speak positive to them. Even when they're wrong and disobedient, the way we go about correcting them either builds them up and edifies them and strengthens them and instructs them and motivates them and stimulates them or it destroys them. So he says, the word of the, the need of the moment. The third thing he says, listen, such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment that it may give grace to those who hear. You know what he's saying? He's saying, look, that our conversation ought to be characterized by three things. First of all, it should be uplifting. Secondly, we should say what needs to be said at that moment. And thirdly, he says it should be gracious kind, good, a blessing to the other person, a blessing to the other person. Now, let's, let's move on down here to something else. Let's move on. Verse 31. He says, now, there may need to be some cleansing in your conversation. Let all bitterness, smoldering resentment, let all smoldering resentment, all bitterness and harshness, and wrath, violent outbreaks of anger, and anger, and clamor, outcries of passion, and slander, injurious speech with the intention to injure the other person. He says, let all that be put away from you along with all malice. Look at that. Bitter, wrath, anger, clamor, slander. He says, put that away. You know why he says put that away? Because listen, none of that matches who we are. The truth is profanity and criticism and angry speech and clamoring speech and injurious speech, none of that matches any of us. We're saints. Now, according to Scripture, saints ought to be building up saints, not tearing down saints, but building up saints. He says, put all that out of your life. It doesn't fit who you are. He says in verse 31, clean up your speech now. But suppose somebody in bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander with along with malice has really just ripped you apart verbally. I mean, they've just torn you asunder. How are you going to respond? Here's how you respond. Look in verse 32. He says, here's a Christ-like response to this. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, Forgiving each other just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. Now, look at that for a moment. He says, be kind to one another. How are you going to be kind to someone who has verbally really worked you over or said something slanderous about you or a, a caustic, critical word? How are you going to respond? If I'm going to be tenderhearted, I've got to ask myself the question, what motivated that? And attempt to discover what their motivation is in the process. And then listen, not only discover what motivated them, but put myself in their position and ask myself the question, if that had happened to me, would I feel the same way? And you know what you'll find out usually? You'll find out that person has been deeply hurt somewhere back there. And they have this reservoir, this volcano of anger or bitterness. And every time the wrong type comes along or somebody that reminds them of what happened to them, it spews out. 
You happen to be the recipient of the bitterness and the anger. You happen to be the recipient of all these mixed up emotional frustrations they have. So instead of defending yourself, ask yourself the question, what motivated that? If the same thing had happened to me, would I feel the same way? Tender-hearted, listen now, forgiving one another just as Christ forgave you. Now think about this. Jesus stretched out on the cross and all they did verbally, listen, they crucified him with spikes, but they also crucified him with their tongues. Well, you're the son of God, why don't you come to I mean, they just let him have it. He never defended himself. He never verbally fought back. You know why? Because he responded in kindness and tender-hearted. You know why? Because he knew where they were coming from. They were coming out of darkness. They were coming out of ignorance. He knew the condition of their heart. Be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving the other person, just as God in Christ, that is through him, also has forgiven you. Here's the one thing I want to say and leave this with you this evening. Just as God in Christ has forgiven me, when you were saved. God accepted you on the basis of what His Son had done for you 2,000 years ago. So at the cross 2,000 years ago, He says positionally, you were crucified with Him. Which means that God took up all the credit cards. Did you know that you can't indebt yourself to God? You don't owe Him anything. He took up the credit cards. There aren't any. Now you may feel like you owe Him something, but you don't owe Him anything. He has totally totally, absolutely, completely, and eternally forgiven you. You say, but you know what I've done? Oh, it doesn't make any difference what you've done. He forgave you before you ever did it. Now, whether you accept it, listen, whether you get in a position through salvation to receive that forgiveness and walk in that forgiveness is something else. But you, forgiveness has been provided for you forever and ever and ever and ever. And God didn't say, I'll forgive you, but you're forgiven. Isn't it strange how somebody can verbally work us over and we want to go back and we either going to give it back to them in order to get even. And I want to remind you that saints never get even. You know what to get even with me? He's in the gutter verbalizing to me. And for me to get even, I've got to get out in the gutter and verbalize back. Saints don't need to defend themselves. They need to walk in the truth and allow the life of Jesus Christ to so be lived through them that the other person will be shamed under the conviction of the Holy Spirit because your kind, tender-hearted, forgiving response absolutely blows their mind. Don't fight your enemies. Conquer them by loving them. In light of who we are but the gift of God's grace, let us speak in a manner worthy.